today on Earth Focus. The global consequences of a changing Arctic. Coming up on Earth Focus. Having traveled to the Arctic region, it's really hard to describe the experience of standing and looking out over miles and miles and miles of ice flows as far as the eye can see. It's a majesty unparalleled uh, on the planet. At the northernmost part of the Earth, the Arctic covers over 5 million square miles and includes parts of the US, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. The Arctic is very, very different depending on uh, where you go, even within individual countries. Um, you, you might have a very developed uh, aspects in the Arctic, and then you might have very uh, underdeveloped areas. This is a place where, where uh, with, with significant urban settings, as well as very small uh, indigenous uh, tribal communities. If you go to Tromsø in northern Norway, it's called the Paris of the North. Beautiful city, amazing infrastructure, better roads than Washington, D.C. They have underground tunnels with roundabouts. Much of the Arctic is unpopulated and little explored. Winter temperatures can plunge to 58 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Summers average 50 degrees above zero or higher. It is a very challenging region to do work in. It is cold and it is dark and it is remote. And in the Arctic, everything happens at a very, very slow rate. If you put your foot down on some piece of moth or some grass, it will probably take years or decades to, to, uh, to regrow. The one thing that is not happening slowly in the Arctic is change. Scientists tell us that every day they are profoundly stunned by the dramatic change that is occurring in the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic is warming faster than any other place on Earth, and one of the ways in which that is demonstrated is in the retreat of summer sea ice, which has been shrinking dramatically over the last several decades. According to NASA scientists, the Arctic is losing about 30,000 square miles of sea ice each year. That's an area the size of Maine. Since 1980, 40% of sea ice cover has disappeared. Scientists expect the Arctic Ocean to be largely free of summer ice by mid-century or sooner. Um, the ice receding, of course, has an impact on, on the environment, on, uh, on, on the fauna and flora in, in the Arctic. Uh, that changes traditional ways of livelihood opportunities in Greenland or, or in Alaska that uh, hunters can no longer get to the seals because the ice is receding. But there are other more troubling consequences. Melting sea ice accelerates warming. Ice reflects the sun rays back into space, but dark open waters exposed by loss of sea ice absorb them. What scientists believe is happening is the more that ice cap shrinks, that dark water absorbs heat faster and it becomes the cycle where the warming uh, actually begins to go faster than what has been projected. So the less ice we have there, uh, and the less surface for the sun to, to bounce its rays off of, the warmer the whole planet comes. And that's how we get into what we call feedback loops. And so the Arctic is kind of a, a bellwether for, uh, for the rest of the planet, that if the Arctic absorbs a lot more heat because the ice is gone, it could have ramifications for, uh, for the rest of the planet. The Arctic is a global air conditioner. It helps regulate climate and weather patterns. As the Arctic warms, wind patterns shift, affecting weather in North America and Europe. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet will also have ramifications for the rest of the planet. It stands to raise global sea levels by 20 feet or more. That will impact places like Bangladesh, uh, Asia, even in the United States, um, the Louisiana coast, the Florida coast. This will still take, you know, several several hundred years, but that's still many, many times quicker than anything we have we have previous, uh, previously seen. And uh, uh, the Greenland ice sheet is definitely melting at unprecedented rates. Throughout the Arctic, permafrost, frozen ground below the soil, is melting. Permafrost, which would be a very firm foundation year-round on which to build airports, roads, schools, houses, is thawing. 
causing foundations to sink and crumble and having buildings actually collapse. That's not just happening in Alaska, it's happening in Russia and other places as well. So the engineering and designing and construction of buildings and public facilities has to change and has to change pretty quickly. The economic costs of melting permafrost can be enormous. The cost of maintaining the Alaska pipeline alone is expected to increase by as much as $6 billion by 2030. But permafrost melt is not the only problem. As the Arctic sea ice melts, storms produce stronger winds and waves, exposing coastal communities to severe erosion. Coastal erosion, which is eating away at the shoreline of villages, means that people are losing schools and tank farms and roads to a very powerful storm season that didn't used to happen. Over 180 Alaskan native villages are presently suffering from floods and erosion. One of them is Kivalina. This barrier island village is losing up to eight feet of shore to erosion each year. Its long-term survival is at stake. Alaska's northern coast has some of the highest shoreline erosion rates in the world. Over 20 communities on the coastline of northern Alaska have been identified as places where either they have to move or they will have to move because they won't be able to be sustained where they are anymore. But where's the money going to come from to move those villages? The warming of the Arctic brings many destabilizing changes, but at the same time it opens up the region to new opportunities. That shrinkage of Arctic summer sea ice means that people are speculating about the possibility of everything from shipping to oil and gas to additional economic development that might have some rather major implications both domestically and internationally. Right now, we are, there are two uh, main passages, the Northern Sea Route or the Northeast Passage over the Russian Arctic primarily, and then the Northwest Passage, which is through the Canadian uh, archipelago. And so the Northern Sea Route is the one right now that has the most economic potential. Rotterdam to Tokyo, for example, from the Netherlands to Japan, is 40% shorter through the Northern Sea Route compared to the Suez Canal. The Northwest Passage, still a lot of ice. The ice likes to stay between all the different islands, and it's not really a shortcut to anywhere. The Northern Sea Route stands to potentially transform global shipping. This Arctic seaway Today there is only limited traffic along the northern sea route. But turning this route into a global commercial highway is a strategic priority for the Russian government. Experts say this will require a $27 billion investment to build rescue and refueling bases, seaports, and capacity to respond to oil spills. Simply put, Russia is a superpower in the Arctic. They have over 50% of the Arctic coastline, so they have the most to gain from the Arctic economic opportunities, and they want to protect uh, their, their future and also protect their territorial integrity, their boundaries. They are now creating uh, a new Ministry of the Arctic. They are upgrading their military posture, creating two Arctic brigades, reopening military bases. That goes above and beyond what any other coastal state is doing. Russia has a strategic interest in the Arctic's oil and gas reserves. So the Arctic is very closely tied and linked to national development uh, in Russia. If Russia wants to remain prosperous or you know, develop hydrocarbon resources, they need to do it in, in the Arctic. The Arctic remains one of the most promising areas in the world for future oil and gas opportunities. So it is an energy storehouse. There are also significant minerals available in that region. There's always these famous numbers by the U.S. Geological Survey being cited that 13% of undiscovered oil and 30% of uh, undiscovered natural gas are located in, in the Arctic. Shrinking of the ice cap now makes offshore exploration in the Arctic feasible. Most of the reserves are thought to be in the Russian and American Arctic. So what Russia needs is technology. They do not have the technology to, to do offshore um, drilling. So they, they needed Western technology, and they also needed Western financing to help. So what we see are joint ventures between Western corporations like Shell and Exxon and state-owned companies like Rosneft and Gazprom. 
Now, after the crisis uh, over Crimea and Ukraine, Western European and American sanctions have targeted technology needs. Uh, and those companies cannot provide the technology and they can't provide the financing that would help. So now that energy production has slowed, uh, ExxonMobil has left its production project in the car sea. One could probably argue that you, the Ukraine sanctions alone might have put certain Arctic developments in Russia by five to ten years behind. The collapse of oil prices in 2014 has also stalled offshore oil drilling plans by Chevron and Norwegian, Danish and French oil companies. Shell, however, is pushing ahead with plans to drill in Alaska's Chukchi Sea, plans that were conditionally approved by the Obama administration. Offshore development in this fragile and pristine environment has some experts concerned. Many of the technologies that have been used in the lower 48 in responding to spills, whether they are small or large, involve mechanical recovery systems that do not assume that they are operating in ice. And ice creates a variety of problems in terms of responding to spills. A recent government study said that if oil is produced in the Chukchi Sea off the coast of Alaska, there's a 75 percent chance of an oil spill. That, would, that could absolutely decimate communities on the north slope of Alaska who rely on the animals in the ocean for food. Uh, if there was a 75 percent chance of me uh, getting on a plane and having that plane crash, there's no way I would go near it. Environmental concerns about spills in the Arctic led Greenpeace activists aboard the ship Arctic Sunrise to board the pre Roslomnia platform, an offshore oil field in the Pechora Sea run by Gazprom, the Russian energy giant. The boats and the people do not represent any threat to safety and security of any person or property or the marine environment. The Roslomnia platform presents an unacceptable risk to the Arctic environment, both in Russia and globally. The first thing we ask you to do is to stop the hosing, stop the hosing because their position becomes unstable and they may fall 15 meters onto the foot of the platform. So we ask you to stop hosing so we can ascertain the situation of the activists. Over. Arctic Sunrise, Arctic Sunrise, which is the uh, calling. We propose you to evacuate uh, all personnel because we will uh, start uh, our uh, water cannons uh, once again So, uh, and we think that more people will be injured. In the end, Russian authorities arrested all 30 members aboard, including two independent journalists, and imprisoned them for three months. This group of activists is known as the Arctic 30. They were eventually uh, granted pardon and released. It was a very strong Russian reaction. I think that also was telling us that uh, uh, Russia is asserting its sovereignty in the Arctic, and people who cross that sovereignty better beware. Will the opening of the Arctic lead to more clashes? Will this resource-rich region become a source of conflict and tension? To date, the relationship of the eight Arctic nations, including Russia, has been a good relationship, I think largely based on a pretty simple premise, which is that there is more of a shared interest than there is a competing interest. I would say that there's very little risk of, of escalating tension in, in the Arctic. Um, that is, of course, not to say that a conflict somewhere else in the world could potentially migrate into the Arctic. Maybe the Arctic could be a place where we can rebuild trust and rebuild the dialogue with Russia. Because the Arctic is so important to them, uh, maybe this is a place where we can start again. If countries can come together and protect this incredible place and say, this is a place where we're not going to exploit, we're going to protect it, then I think we have a shot at preserving our future.